<laughs> well, and also like what a defeat guy, right? He he's got a bribe <laughs> right. to pork rolls, but he can't forego his chicken dinner. <laughs> he's like, uh, oh yeah, I'm chicken. I you know, so. I'm convinced he paid historians to call him the Lionhearted. Honestly, that's totally possible. Honestly, I think he actually totally put possible. like a lion here, and so they would be like, "Oh, that guy with a lion over his heart, Lionheart." Yeah, yeah. Oh God, he, yeah, he was the George Costanza, of such England, a poser. Right? Welcome, everyone, to another episode of WTF History. This is the podcast where we go through two vignettes that are closely connected, and you tell us which one made you say WTF. Here's my wonderful co-host, David Quintana. That's right. And today, today we're going to go into two uh, fascinating episodes of history that are you know, crazy disappearances, and we've got some really fascinating stories for you today. And we want to hear from you. You know, Mike, my, my favorite part of the comments, though, is when they talk about how wrong we are on everything. So that, yes. And I, I love like that. that too. Yeah. Correct like us. That correct us. Correct us. Yeah. Tell us, tell us which details you wanted to see. Um, someone had some great comments to one of our American uh, history episodes. So please uh, let us have it. Even if you don't like David's shirt, I don't like David's shirt. So write that in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got? All right, man? So, so, so today we're going to, the theme of my disappearance is this is, this is how chicken contributed to the disappearance and the kidnapping of an English monarch. Surely, hopefully right now, they're already saying WTF. But I want to first to give this, this, this episode takes place at the time of the Crusades. Oh, but which Crusades? I'm going to go a little bit into the history of chicken. Which Crusades? So, Oh, gosh, I hope you were not going to ask that. <laughs> this was the so-called King's Crusades. I don't remember the number of it. So everyone's probably familiar with the slogan from the 1928 presidential election, which is a chicken in every pot. What people don't understand is that chicken right now is in many ways the cheapest source of animal protein. Um, you know, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. But in the 1920s and throughout all of history, chicken was a rich man's food. And I know that's hard to believe. But if you think about it, I mean, look, my grandfather, who's born in 1900, um, his protein when he was growing up was eggs because you had to be fantastically wealthy to kill that animal that was providing the eggs for your family. And they just didn't do it. You just didn't kill a chicken. It would be like killing a milk cow. Yeah. And chicken was extremely expensive. And so when, when, you know, when the Republican Party campaigned in 1928 on a chicken in every pot, that would be like today saying a filet mignon for dinner every night. And this fascinating story about the Crusades and uh, the disappearance of an English king and a kidnapping has to do with chicken. So our story starts with one of history's greatest and you're going to love this guy, David. This was Leopold the fifth and his mm, name. I'm right? a Leopold the fourth guy. Always oh, have been. No. <laughs> Always have been. Well, Leopold, Leopold the fifth, <laughs> right? His name, first of all, has a lion connotation. Most mm -hmm. of you know that he was the progenitor of the Austrian empire and indirectly the house of Habsburg. He came from the house of Babenberg, which David probably knows intermarried three times with the Habsburgs and later formed the Habsburg family. But this is well before Austria is an empire. This is when it is essentially a kind of small state um, in the middle of Europe. And of course, the king of England at the time was Richard Lionheart, also a lion. In his oh, name. that was you the know, great. Very, that, was, that was actually the crusade of the crew. That was like the crusades at their peak the crusade. Yeah. This yeah. is the crusaders crusade. Yes. Baby. That was yeah. the crusade right there. Yes. You're right. Yeah. So both of these guys call the dude, call the, uh, or answer the call of the Pope to go take up arms and try to liberate the Holy land. That's how they viewed it. And so these, you know, all these monarchs are going over there and, uh, you know, um, Leopold V is off there fighting. He brings his guys. But what's really important is technically he was a vassal at this moment of the Holy Roman Empire. Mm. You guys know what the Holy Roman Empire was. It was mostly German-speaking, agglomeration of states and duchies and kingdoms in the middle of Europe. And, you know, he is a, you know, what's called a sovereign duke. It's the highest in the land. There is nobody above him. He doesn't have a king, but his 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 area, his his um his monarchy, his his kingdom, for lack of a better word, his dukedom is too small to be considered a kingdom just yet. So this is very, very important for our story. He is a sovereign duke. Leopold is a sovereign duke. And he is fighting because, frankly, the Holy Roman Empire did not send that many people. So he's sort of their representative there. So they have this crazy battle, crazy battle against the Muslim forces. And Leopold, unlike Richard, 
He is fighting personally. He is in there, guys. He is in there. He's, he's wielding his sword. He fights all day long. And at the end of his, uh, at the end of this battle, he takes off his sword sheath. Okay. And the story, this was eyewitnessed by thousands of people. He takes off his sword sheath. He is wearing a white crusader's tunic. The only spot of his white tunic that was not stained with blood was when he took off his sword. Oh, well, that's a good line. I like now, that. I don't, I don't know if it's true or not, but that's good. Why is this important? Folks, take a look at the flag of Austria. Oh. The flag of Austria to this day is blood red with one white stripe. Whoa. And this is where they this is when they made the modern flag right. of Austria. That's good. How tough was Leopold and why do I personally believe this? Later on in his life, he needed to have his foot amputated. He was wounded in a jousting tournament. He had to have his foot amputated. They didn't have a surgeon. His guy said, do you want to wait for a surgeon? He, did it he goes, nah, just pick up that ax over oh. there and hack it off. Took this guy's three hacks, but they hacked off his foot with an ax. So this was a real tough guy, right? This is somebody you don't want to mess with. But anyway, he's fighting personally. All these kings are not, right? And uh, at the end, they take this fortress and they put up the flags, right? They put up the flags of the victorious army and they put up the previous you know flag of austria and uh richard lionheart of england is like uh, uh, uh take that down and everyone's like why this guy's a war hero i mean he was fighting you weren't uh, <laughs> yeah, right. why are we gonna take his flag down he goes well you know because i'm a king he's just a duke he's just a duke and i'm a king and uh, we got to take his flag down now the austrians were pissed they're like well wait a second we're fighting on behalf of an empire we're fighting on behalf of the holy roman empire and our guy's a war hero got to leave his flag up and richard's like nah I'm a king. Take his flag down. So Leopold was pissed off. And this is not a guy you want to piss off. So he takes his men. His men wouldn't fight anymore after this. They're like, you know, our flag should be up there with everybody else. They go home. They go home to Austria. And, uh, you know, uh, their lack of presence makes some of the battles turn. And now it's time for Richard Lionheart of England to go home. At that point, his advisors go up to him and they say, well, um, you know, we got uh, some bad news and some good news and some bad news. And he goes, well, tell me what the news is. They go, well, the bad news is, is that the ports of France are closed for you to land. Oh, by the way, their ships could not make it all the way to England. They were kind of damaged and stuff like that. And they had to sail from the Holy Land all the way to where they could get back to Europe somehow. And they had to do so fast. So his advisors say, okay, bad news. The ports of France are closed to you. Ports of Spain are closed to you. And by the way, Italy just close its ports to you because they remember what you did in Sicily, you know, Corleone, Lionheart, all that stuff. So yeah, uh, there's only one place we can land. And he goes, oh, that's great. So one place we can land in, in Europe. It's Venice. Okay, great. What's, what's the problem? You got to march through Leopold's territory <laughs> to get to your cousin who was the king of Bavaria. And he's like, ah, oh, crap. So what does Richard Lionheart do? The guy's surname is Lionheart. Hey, he dresses as a peasant. Look, hey, look, can, let's just have a quick time out here. Yeah. I am not a big fan of Richard the Lionhearted. I believe I. he is an absentee father. He is yeah. of England. He was never in England because he was off That's gallivanting right. on the continent, having fun. Yeah. One of the worst Plantagenets of all time. Not a fan. <laughs> So anyway, I had to put that in. <laughs> that's that's damning. That's a damning review from David Quintana. Right. Seriously, because this man knows his plantation. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. even know if I'm pronouncing. Don't get correctly. me started. <laughs> so you know this this guy who's got this reputation in England, you know, for being courageous. What does he do? He dresses up as a peasant and hides. He decides <laughs> that, is that so Richard. He, yeah, he's he's gonna go through the territory of this notorious badass who's really pissed off at him, dressed as a peasant. So he goes and buys like the stinky, dirty ro robes of like pilgrims who had come back. Back at the time, Christians thought that they had to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, much right. like Muslims make a pilgrimage mm -hmm. to Mecca these days. So there's all these pilgrims coming back. He's like, yeah, I'll give you a couple shillings for your robe. He takes on these stinky, dirty robes. And he is not his men are camping out in Austria or thereabouts one night. But Leopold got a word. He got rumor that Richard was going through his territory. So he sends out search parties. And his search parties are, you know, riding on horseback through all these areas where people are, and they smell chicken roasting. Mm. <laughs> and they're like, wait a second, these poor 
peasants can't afford chicken. <laughs> like that's a rich man's food. Oh, Nobody that's good. chicken. Nobody's rich enough to afford chicken. So they go over and they, you know, they inspect and they've got drawings of Richard and they go, y'all are eating chicken. Can, You're a king. That's kind of funny. I can see and, them holding up an etching. Yeah, that's yes, him. That's you. <laughs> and so they grab King Richard Lionheart and they kidnap him. Now, of course, guys, this is before intelligence services. This is before the internet. This is before the postal. I mean, this is, this is before everything. So all the, that, that England and Richard's you know, substantial continental French holdings know is that the king is missing. The king has disappeared. Nobody knows where he is for many, many months. And this kind of triggers a crisis, right? They don't know, do we, do we elect a new, or, you know, do we, do we pass the throne on? What do we do? But finally, you know, you know, word comes out that, uh, that King Leopold has Richard and he's holding him hostage. Which was common and, back then. Very common. Um, well, common. well, actually not that common at the monarch level. Oh, right. The, not at the, the monarch pope, level, but yeah. Yeah. The, the Pope spoke out. The Pope, you know, um, uh, he was very upset and he said, you know what? I understand that this happens between, you know, knights and yeah. nobles. Right. A monarch has never done this. And by the way, I'm the Pope and I'm technically a monarch. So let's not start this whole hostage yes, thing right. with monarch. I stand corrected. And, yes. They would take other yeah. nobles. Yeah. Precisely. Correct. But but he throws him in a dungeon. And at first, you know, he's treating him like a hostage, like a like a noble hostage. But at some point, you know, he's like, you know, this guy bothers me. And he like the food gets worse and worse. The chains get tighter. He keeps he keeps Richard Lionheart hostage for like a year and a half. The king trust of England. Me, trust me, no one missed him. Right. Trust me. But but I mean, he's just humiliating the guy yeah. for a year and a half. And I mean, hopefully, you know, through this major, major story, there's a million WTFs, you know, how expensive chicken was. Most people don't yeah, know that. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, how chicken resulted in the capture of a European monarch. How this amazing bat, you know, had fought this amazing battle in blood stained his tunic. And then how he ended up capturing a European monarch. But of course, all that stuff, is nothing compared to the lesson that David and I like to say, which is be careful how you treat people. This guy disrespected the wrong guy. He disrespected the wrong guy and the guy didn't forget. And as soon as he was in a position to screw him over, he smelled his chicken cook it and he snapped him up and he resulted, he disappeared an English monarch for a year and a half. Yeah, dude, that's a, that's a really, really good story. I like that a lot. And it does, it brings up so many different parts of history, which is, yeah, the poor people didn't eat chicken. They ate, Honestly, they ate bread and they dipped yeah. it, you know, in gruel and then they ate that. <laughs> and then, yeah, it's yeah. sausage because that was the entrails, right? It was like the snout right. and you right. know, ground up the right. snout. Got snout sausage right. tonight, guys. Yeah, they didn't eat freaking chicken. Freaking yeah. Richard. You know, that is so on brand with that guy. <laughs> Still on brand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, and also, like, what a defeat guy, right? He he's got a bribe, <laughs> right? Pork rose, but he can't forego his chicken dinner. <laughs> he's like, oh, oh yeah, I'm chicken. I <laughs> you know, so. I'm convinced he paid historians to call him the Lionhearted. Honestly, that's totally possible. Honestly, I think he actually totally put possible. like a lion here, and so they would be like, oh, that guy with a lion over his heart, Lionheart. Yeah, yeah. Oh God, yeah, he was a George Costanza, of England, such a right? poser. But that's a yeah. good story for so many different well, reasons. Well, tell me your story. I mean, you've got another crazy disappearance yeah, that's going to blow up. It is. Mind. So I'm going to go a little modern on this one. In 1928, the three richest people in the world were mm, not necessarily the first two. Well, yeah, I think we are. It was Rockefeller, Henry Ford, and Alfred Lowenstein. Um, you've never heard of Lowenstein, have you? I have yeah, not. and I'm not doing that to you. I mean, just in general, you've never heard of Alfred Lowenstein, but he was the third richest man in the world. Wow. He uh, he was born to a banking family in Belgium, and he made his money. He was an early he was early into electricity, the production of electricity, of electrical power. He also, and you know, people may laugh at this, but it was a huge, huge money making endeavor for him. He was one of the first people into artificial silk. So remember back in the days, the women would wear silk, but it was too expensive. So women wanted sure. to look like they were wearing silk. So they created the synthetic silk. And then he moved into investments and he had a uh, investment company, which the name I really love because it's so such an evil villain name. It is International Holding and Investments Limited. 
Like if that's not if that's not an evil villain company, I love it. I don't know what it is. International Investments, International Holdings and Investments Limited, and it was huge. He had two partners there. Um, his partners were uh, Frank Svarsky and Alfred Pam. In addition to being the third richest man, he was probably also the third biggest asshole. So <laughs> no one liked him. <laughs> like no one, no one liked Alfred. Even the people that loved him didn't like him. Um, he was famous for being just cutthroat, just an ass, just like you know, he was just a complete asshole. Um, no, he was mean to people. Whatever, you know. I guess he had to be in that in that you know rough and tumble world of financiers, you know, to get ahead. But he was. I mean, not, it's not but like this is the type. Of, this is the type of guy who you know sounds like you know like he he'd like his golf caddy would hang around for a tip and he'd be like smack. Yeah, yeah. Right. Here's like, your tip. Get a real job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. That guy. That guy. So it, this is important too, right? So he was third richest man, first biggest soul. Um, you know, it's interesting though. He um had a lot of business dealings all around the world. He later became kind of like a precursor to BlackRock or Goldman Sachs. He would take his um energy production because again, he was one of the first people to figure out how to produce electricity um on a, you know, on a wide wide basis, right, that he could then sell to 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 communities. Um he would take that to underdeveloped countries, kind of like, right? Goldman Sachs and BlackRock, and he would set up these deals with them. We'll, we will bring, um, you know, power to your country. You, you know, you pay us, you do this bond. And, you know, he would, he would just make money hand over fist through that stuff. So, by the way, that's another way of making enemies, right? So you have people all around the world who hate you because, yes, you brought energy, but, you know, you're robbing them blind, right, on the, on the interest and the prices and whatever else you extracted from them to get it. It's a funny story about him during World War One. Um, the Germans, you know, um, took possession of Belgium and he went to the uh, he went to the Belgium government and said, look, here's what I'll do. I will bail you out. I will pay. Right. I will pay for the Belgium government to be able to come back and, and do everything they need to do to run their government. If you give me the franchise to print your money. So if you allow oh, yeah. if you allow me to print your money, I will give you fifty million dollars, government of Belgium. You guys can get back on your feet, right, and begin to operate. But all I want is the franchise to print your money. And they were like, "Hit the door, dude!" So again, <laughs> crazy. More evidence of his ass. Um, so crazy. on July fourth, nineteen twenty-eight, he was married to Madeline. Uh, she was kind of a high society girl. She was able to get him into societal circles because of her family. Um, and she just wanted to have fun. So essentially, they had a deal. They slept in separate bedrooms. They lived separate lives. Um, she could go out. She could have her fun, live her best flapper life, right? And he would be able to take her around and say, hey, this is my beautiful young wife and blah, blah, blah. For all appearances, it seemed to be like a good relationship that they had struck. She was younger than him. Um, on July 4th, 1928, um, he was on his way to kind of finalize a deal in Argentina, another one of these, you know, Goldman Sachs types deals, you know, where he brings infrastructure in. But they were going to fly to Belgium first. So they were leaving Croydon in below south of south of London. They were going to fly over the channel and go to Brussels. You know, it's it's a thing that they had done forever. Like he this was a this was like him taking the train home. So uh, and remember, he had his he had his private planes, which in 1928 would be like having a private space rocket. You know, so that's just, again, evidence of his wealth. Um, so he was on the plane with six people. This honestly, Mike, this is like an Agatha Christie novel more than it is a piece of history. Um, it like I expected at any time as I was doing the story to have, uh, you know, Hercule Poirot walk in. And, you know, go, I know who did it. So on the plane, it's a Fokker F7, um, and there were six people on the plane. There were two pilots. There was a pilot and a mechanic up front, Donald Drew and Robert Little. Donald was the pilot. Robert was the mechanic. In the back of the plane, we had him, and then we had his valet, which was Fred Baxter, his secretary, Arthur Hodgson, and two stenographers, Eileen Clark and Paula Bedallin. The Fokker F7, 1928, very interesting plane. 
There's a, a hinged door that you open. Hinged. This is important. It's a hinged door that you open. Walk in. When you walk in, there's a like a three-foot lobby. And you take a left, and you walk into the passenger area. Now, when I say passenger area, you're picturing a normal airplane like we have today. That's not, yeah, that's not what it was. I looked at the pictures. It was, it was like a small RV was the size of the passenger area, 1928. So you go in there, very, very crude, right? It's probably fancy for their time, for our times, very crude. Again, probably a small RV is the size of the seating area. I say that on purpose because that lets you know that it's not like they were sitting 20 yards from the bathroom. Um, walk in, you sit down. A couple of the seats are facing the rear, as is common. Um, and a couple of seats facing the other way. The two pilots were in the front of the plane, but it was inaccessible from interior of the plane. So the pilot and the mechanic were in the front, but the pilot compartment was not accessible from inside the plane. You'd have to go out to a separate door. So they're on the plane. In the back, we have the valet, we have the secretary, we have the two stenographers, and we have Mr. Lowenstein, the third richest man in the world. A little bit into it, you know, he has been writing notes, copious notes the entire time. He says, you know, hey, I got to go to the bathroom. He walks to the back of the plane. He shuts the door, that lobby door to the passenger compartment. He shuts that. And he goes into the bathroom. We think. But a half an hour later, like no one has seen Mr. Lowenstein and his valet, Mr. Baxter, is like, hey, I'm going to go check on, on Al. Like, what's going on with Al? So Baxter goes back there and he says that he doesn't see Lowenstein and he sees the entrance door open and flapping in the wind. And they look, right? And it's like a plain toilet. You can't get sucked down it. Um, he was a very healthy man, right? He wasn't going to get sucked down a toilet. So everybody starts looking for the for for Mr. Lowenstein, right? And he goes and he gets uh, he gets the uh, secretary Hodgson. Hodgson goes back and he's like, no, I can't see him. We don't know where he went. Third richest man in the world, right? Went to the bathroom. He's right. on. A, he's on a plane. Baxter says the door is open, and flapping in the wind. So they go up to the pilot's window and they're like, "Dude, we got to stop. We can't. You know, we don't know where 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 uh, Lowenstein is." So the pilots can't hear them because if you've been in a plane like this, I flew a lot, and so very very loud. So they write out a note: "We need to land. We're missing out. You know, whatever it says." Another another interesting part: the crew never radios the tower. And say, hey, this is Fokker F7. We're missing Mr. Lowenstein. We can't find him on the plane. They never do that. They are minutes away from an airport, which is right in their flight path in France. They don't go there. Instead, they double back and they land on the beach at Dunkirk. They land on the beach. The Fokker F7 lands on the beach. The beach has... French soldiers there because you know, remember right I mean this was after World War One sure, World War Two sure. was right around the corner but you know you know what I mean strategic Europe, area yeah right strategic area Europe in that tight was a little it was a little you know it was a little uh, little frosty they didn't land on the airport they never radioed the tower they land on the beach the soldiers go out there and they're like hey what's going on why are you guys on our beach and they're like oh well you know we're missing a passenger they never say we're missing Alfred Lowenstein the third richest man in the world so they take him to the local fort. Right, which is there off of the Dunkirk Beach, and they're interviewed. Their stories are kind of similar, but a little different. Again, they're sticking with the story that the door was flapping in the wind. Um, the the officer that interviewed them, he said that they all were very, very, very nervous, which I guess could happen if you're missing your boss. They did not let him know the boss's name until a half an hour into the interviews. A half an hour into the interviews, okay. they finally go, oh, yeah, and our boss is Alfred Lowenstein. You might have heard of him. Maybe, <laughs> maybe the three, he might own sure. his beach, you know? And so sure. oh, half an hour into the interview, do they finally say who their boss is? And they're like, oh, shit. All right, well, what happened? And they go, we think he walked out the bath. We think he walked out the wrong door. In other words, <laughs> they, they're telling the soldiers, we think instead of him walking into the bathroom on the left, he walked out and fell out the plane. Which, I mean, you, you were in the Air Force and you flew a lot. And, you know, I, I have a good sense of these historical planes. I mean, you'd have to be really, really drunk to walk out the wrong door. Drunk plus absent-minded plus, I don't know. 
I, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's pretty freaking hard. Once the story became na- became international, right? Because actually okay. the markets reacted to his missing, right? Wow. They didn't find a body. Um, every aviation expert then and now says okay. you can't open a door like that. A human can't open it. Uh, if you have like maybe three super strong men, you might be able to open it. And that's it. because they were traveling sufficient speed and the door would The be... pressure. Yeah. yeah, you couldn't open the door okay. because of the pressure. Remember, it wasn't the ones that you see on planes now, which are like little, like they fit into the hole. This was on hinges, sure. remember? So yeah, you'd have to okay. open it and the pressure would stop. Here's the other thing. The aviation expert said, even if you open the door a little bit. I mean, listen, I've opened a car door at 30 miles an hour. Right. And Try it's it. really hard. It's really hard. And it slams shut. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Here's the other part that people don't talk about a lot in the investigation of this case. The door to the bathroom was the same door to the lobby. So think about it. So the way the la- that lot, remember how I told you when you walk in, there's a lobby, you go to your left, there's the passengers. Well, when you walk in, in the beginning, you walk to the left and it's open. That's the way to the passengers. But if you go to the bathroom, you take that bathroom door and you shut it towards the lobby. So the lobby bathroom, the lobby door and the bathroom door are the same door. So if he had walked in and shut the lobby door, which he did, the bathroom door would have been open. Because it was the same door that you used to shut to the lobby. So... The idea that he did that is crazy. So let me get to the to the other part. So the soldiers let him go. They let everybody go. They right. go, well, it sounds yeah. about right. And so, uh, well, I mean, you know, they didn't commit a crime. No. And and yeah. the two pilots uh, or the pilot and the mechanic, they told the soldiers, look, we've tried to open that door before. And it does open when you're flying. And they said, oh, OK, well, okay. It makes sense. And who knew about flying then? Right. Sure. So yeah, I'm in, very few people had ever flown. Right. I was in the military and I realized that if you do open a door like that during while you're flying, decompression will occur. And everybody in that passenger compartment would have like lost all their stuff. No, no, and okay, their so ears. Let, let me let me be the dork. Let me be the dork and say, I know what you mean by decompression, but we should be clear. These are not pressurized cabins. This is not pressurized cabin like a modern jet. They're not flying at 30,000 feet. They're flying at, you know, 8,000 well, feet. They're, they're flying at 4,000 feet. So 4, lower. Feet, okay. There is some, there is some compression. Oh, there's pressure. There is some yes. compression, but the wind, when it came in, yes. it blown everything all around. It would affect it everybody sure. instantly, like instantly. For sure. For um, sure. So, so to dig it, I mean, this, this is, this is one of my favorite stories you've ever told because I have been at the edge of my seat, right? Let, try, so look, what happened? Yeah. You got to tell us what happened. What happened here? So, so after that, the wife, Madeline, cause remember he's the third richest man in the world. The wife started looking for the body because in Belgium, she could not inherit anything unless a body was found. And if the body's not found, they have to freeze all assets for four years. So there was no investigation. So there were no investigations. And the reason for no investigation was that it happened over international waters. So no one knew whose jurisdiction it was. So a body did appear two weeks later um, and it was floating in the in the in the channel and a fisherman found it and they only identified it through his wristwatch. That's the only way they could identify because it had been in the water so long. And they did pay her, his family paid for a coroner or her family paid for a coroner's inquest. And they found that he was alive when he hit the water and all every bone in his body was broken. He had a fractured skull and it said he had a hole in his abdomen. So um, he was found. But who did it? Who did it? So there are three theories. One, that it was suicide. Well, he was planning his uh, i mean everybody said they saw him making business notes while he was sitting there he had actually sure. stopped the plane in order to make dinner reservations with a um with a nobleman from canada for the following week so he stopped the plane he made sure that the plane waited okay. so he's planning for the future and he seems like he's planning for the future his normal corporate right guy. right so uh, okay so he's making plans so the idea that it was a suicide really doesn't seem likely secondly if it was a suicide that means he had to open that door and there was no way he was opening that door i think that's just a fiction the second thing was that it was an accident 
people thought it was an accident. And that's what the crew and all the passengers went with. It was an, it must have been an accident. He must have went out the wrong door. Well, I think that's not even worth discussion because there's no way he could have opened that door. And there's no way he could have opened that door without everyone immediately having this huge gust of wind come throughout the passenger cabin. So it's not that. So I believe, and I think many people believe, it was murder. But who did it? Who did it? So there's a couple different theories. Um, one theory is that he had it been engaged in some bad business deal. So we do know that he was meeting with a gangster by the name of Rothstein um, to bring the heroin trade to the United States. So this was this was, you know, it was during Prohibition. Right. And I think people had seen how alcohol had boomed and Rothstein had an idea that he wanted to bring heroin to the United States. Now, is this the same gangster who was, you know, uh, he was very sort of during the heyday of the 1920s. This is the Al Capone. This is the, the, uh, yeah. Uh, Lucky Luciano era. Yes. This guy's been in movies, right? Yeah. Is, is this the guy that fixed the 1919 19, That was the same. Yeah, he so, fixed the 1919 okay. World Series. Wow. So Lowenstein was having a series of meetings with him, well-documented meetings with him. And the idea was because of his awesome. manufacturing background. Because remember, heroin was being made legally in those sure. days. Right. So with his manufacturing yeah. background, he was going to help create the manufacturing of the heroin in Europe. And then he was going to work with Rothstein to bring the heroin to the United States. So there's the idea that Rothstein either crossed, double crossed Lowenstein, or when Lowenstein died, that dried up Rothstein's money. And so the people who were involved, right, killed Rothstein. But people are there. That is one theory that he was murdered by people who were involved with that heroin racket that they were cooking up. The second one are his partners, Pam and Sparsky or Swarsky that they were the three people who were the principals in International Holdings and Investments Limited. If he were gone, which was worth over a billion dollars, right, in today's money, if he were gone, all of that money would go to them, right? Okay, but and again, no one liked I, I, I still, I still, like w when you said, you know, the third theory is murder, I kept waiting for you to say it was somebody on the plane, but you're talking about people who are not on the plane. And so they still would have to, get somebody on the plane Correct. right so so after he died the stock tumbled for international holdings right tumbled but if you knew that that was coming you could make a killing and they did they made 200 million dollars uh his partners uh because they bought it their, they bought it at the right time uh their own stock and they made 200 million dollars off of that so they benefited right who was the other person who benefited Madeline, his wife, who was the only person that searched for the body, his wife. Madeline. But you still let me interrupt again, because my mind is blown this is a great story. And, and the great story is the ones that, that get interaction. Uh, you still need to convince these people on the plane who are they're not they don't sound like they were gangsters. They sound like it was, you know, the guy who helped him, who was like his personal secretary. And these, you still had to convince one of them to do something nefarious you know, and you still have the problem of the door opening and uh, so, people hearing it. And... So those are the three suspects. Okay. But I don't think any of the suspects actually killed him. I think the killing okay. was done on the plane. Fast. Um, he was found with alcohol in his body and he was a notorious teetotaler. So oh, wow. there are okay. thoughts that he was poisoned while on the plane. And then okay. the body was dumped. So a question is yeah. the, the, the theory is either that the door was rigged right to be a door that could okay. be more easily opened and then his body was thrown over okay. or they landed on the beach to hand the body off to someone that then went and planted it so basically the, basically the that, that this 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 guy and his associates have more money than god there's a ton of money at stake that basically everybody on the plane could have been bribed everybody could have been bribed so yeah, wow. in later years, so so Madeline, right, searched for the body because remember the estate was frozen for four years if she couldn't produce a body. For sure. So think, thankfully the body was later found and two weeks later and she was able to get the money. So Madeline got a third of International Investments and Holdings wow. Limited um, and she got all the wealth and, you know, whatever. So the idea that I'm going with is I think that Madeline 
bought off everybody on the plane. Remember, the valet and the secretary, they knew her, too. They knew her, too. But, you know, they're, 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 let me let me push back on that. And I want to raise a fourth possibility. So the pushback is uh, there's a saying in Italy that two can keep a secret if one of them's dead. And, you know, I mean, you got to have major chutzpah if you're this beautiful, young, you know, wife. You go up to this guy's personal secretary and you say, hey, by the way, I'm going to give you 50 million to kill your boss. Now, yes, he was hated. OK, but why doesn't that guy just go to him and say, hey, I got some information. Will you pay me 60 million if you <laughs> if it promises to be good? Right. I mean, it's just so hard for for six people or seven people. I mean, a pilot, a mechanic, you know, especially if, if the most logical thing is right, that they landed on the beach and they kind of, you know, are they are they are they slowed down mm -hmm. and then, you know, yeah, right. I mean, you would need to have a conspiracy with like eight people, nine people, 10 people. I mean, that's hard to pull it off. It is hard to pull off. And we're never going to know. Everybody is long, long gone. I can tell you Fred Baxter, the man that found the door flapping in the wind, apparently. He, four years late, shortly after that, he went to work f for uh, Alfred's son, Bobby, who, okay. you know, helped, he, who also got some of the estate, apparently through the mother. Um, in England. So he went to work. He became his valet. Within four years, he was found dead in Bobby's estate with a bullet through his head. It was called a suicide. It was Bobby Lowenstein's gun. We don't know huh. how it happened. He had become an inveterate in a he had become a notorious gambler. We don't know where he got the money to go as in mm. debt as a gambler as he had. Um, huh. Robert, everybody else kind of made off. They did suddenly very much. They were doing much better financially than they were prior to the disappearance of Albert Lowenstein. But the most the most obvious one was Fred Baxter. Can I ask a fourth possibility? And this one's kind of out there. Sure. Is it possible that he faked his death? This is before DNA. You know what that is? This is that is another possibility. And that is another one that's thrown out there. It's not one that I believe, but it's one that right. people use a lot. And here's why I don't believe it. I don't believe it because this was a man who loved his horses. His horses won the steeplechase. He loved his life. He had this beautiful estate in Biarritz. He had an estate in England, right? He had airplanes when there were rocket ships. I mean, this man loved yeah. life. He was involved in dealings. He could have been running away from something and faked his death to get away. That's true. He could have. Yeah, I mean, you just wonder. You just wonder if, like, you know, his relationship with the gangsters. One of the gangsters said, "Listen, uh, you're dead. You know, I'm going to get you. Like, unless you do this deal, you're dead." And then he's realized that the deal can go. So he fixes his own death. Back in the day, people actually did this. They, you know, before DNA, before grid dental records, all this stuff, you could do that. You just needed a coroner to say, "Oh yeah, that was his watch," well, we, and yeah, this is him. Well, you know what? He did. He he did have activity in that place that people often go to disappear from in those days, Argentina, right? If you go to Argentina, you see all the German names and Italian, right? Because people like, hey, they would escape Europe and go over to Argentina. Um, so that that's where he was going right down the road to close a deal. But it just seems hard that a guy like him at the age of 51 would just disappear. I don't know. Maybe, though. We don't know. Yeah, and 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 obviously there would be some weird, mysterious, wealthy guy who lived another thirty years somewhere with a billion. Right. You know, like, so, yeah, in an eight-story hut in the in the yeah. jungle. Yeah, he was buried in an unmarked grave, um, at his wife's family's, uh, you know, graveyard. You know how old families, you know, they have their old, you know, cemeteries. So he was buried. There's no grave marker. The third richest man, which is buried in an essentially an unmarked grave. His wife died in 1938. Curiously enough, his son, the the last living relative of his, Bobby, who Fred Baxter went to work for before he killed himself, before he, you know, un, whatever word we use nowadays, I don't get YouTube to, to cancel us, before he unalived himself at Bobby's home. Um, Bobby joined the RAF, and in 1941, he died in an air crash accident. So by 1941... There was no living trace left of the third richest man in 1928. To me, uh, that is one of the most interesting parts of this story. Yeah, that that is really fascinating. And then, um, but you know, the unmarked grave thing. I mean, I don't know. I, my money that that made the odds of scenario four that he faked his own death be a little bit higher because, again, 
you're that wealthy, you're that smart, you go to all these things. If that theory was true, you know, having an unmarked grave where nobody can dig up the body and say, well, gee, this was really my great aunt Willie, who was a wino who they paid off. I mean, you know, it's um, that makes it more likely to me that that could have been something that happened. But you got me down this rabbit hole now. <laughs> I know. I'm going to read. <laughs> I know what I'm reading. I'm going to be looking for books yeah. on this. I know. know. This is a great story. Dude, I love this story. And it goes as deep as you want to go, by the way. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you want to go deep into this story, you can go deep into this story. And that's why it was so <laughs> hard to keep this story on track because there were so many different angles to it. We could have just spent For all sure. our time going down the, you know, the uh, mobster and the heroin hole. So um, sure. I love this story. Thanks, Mike. This has been really fun. And I would love to hear who the uh, who the audience believes did it or what the wh whether it was suicide, disappearance, murder, right, or accident. Yeah. Us your theories in the comments, folks. I want to hear what you what you come up with. Yeah. And thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening to another episode of WTF History. If you like what you hear, throw us a like, throw us a subscribe. We look forward to hearing from you. All right, man. Thanks, Mike. See you guys. Hey, if you like what you hear, like and subscribe. It really means a lot. And we would love to have you coming back every week. Thank you.